Uh, we are going to depart a little bit from the way I normally do things. This message, uh, the Spirit of Prophecy tells us that not only is it present truth, but it is a message that God commanded. He's not suggesting or requesting. He's commanding this message be given. And it is the third angel's message in verity, she says, or in truth. So the Christ our righteousness message that this church received in 1888, it is so vital to our understanding. And yet when I gave this first part in May here, two weeks or three weeks later I gave it at my home church at Lena. And I had several people come up to me and said, too much information, too fast. We're not getting it. They're not connecting the dots. And it's so important that we understand this message one of the elders wanted me to put on a seminar, and I said, how do I do that from the pulpit? So I asked him, I said, will a PowerPoint presentation help? And he thought that, that it would, and I talked to several other people, and they thought it would, and that's why this morning we are going to, I'm going to have a power presentation, but I'm going to go, I'm going to have a review. I, we're going to very methodically, systematically go through this message so everybody understands it. And if you don't understand it, please let me know or stop me until you do because this is absolutely critical to your salvation. So this is why we're, I'm doing this this morning. My main objective... Uh, did I hit the wrong button here, Ken? Up and down doesn't work. He told me we might have this problem. I... <laughs> it worked back there. I know he tried it. But at any rate, our main objective, the first part that if we get it working, it will come up is Christology. And that's the study of who... Jesus was, the person of Jesus. And Professor uh, Dennis Forte at camp meeting, who was a professor of, historic, of history and theology at the seminar at Andrews University, made the comment that Jones and Wagner were the first two people to really nail down just who Jesus was. And if we get this working, hopefully we'll see some of that. So our main my main objective this morning is who Jesus was. And the second part is going to be soteriology there, okay, there was the first part. Can everybody see that? Is there any magic to this now? That, no, no, okay. okay, thank you. So it's Christology is a study of who Jesus is. And then wrong way. Okay. It's the other other right. Soteriology is a study of how Jesus saves us. So, and this is critical, so I get, we're going to go very slow through this, but we're going to have a little review. Not only does God call, but he draws. It is God that takes the initiative. That's what our first study was on back in May. All of you are here this morning because of the Holy Spirit. Do not give yourself any credit. The Apostle Paul writes in Romans chapter 7 that there is nothing good that dwells in our flesh. It is the Holy Spirit, and that's his responsibility to come after us, to awaken us. So the first question I have is, what is the condition for eternal life? We're going to go right back to the very basics. What is the condition for eternal life? I'm not asking how we are saved. John 17, 3. Okay. To know God. This is from Steps of Christ, and Professor uh, Dennis Forte had a study at camp meeting, one of the seminars I went to that I enjoyed, was on the Steps of Christ. And it says, the condition for eternal life is now just what it had always been, just what it was in paradise before the fall of our first parents. Perfect obedience to God's law. Amen. Perfect righteousness. If eternal life was granted on any condition short of this, then the happiness of the whole universe would be in peril. The way would be open for sin with all its trains of woe and misery to be immortalized. Now the emphasis here is mine. But notice he defines perfect obedience 
as righteousness. As does Paul in Romans chapter 6 and verse 16. So, the, the way to get to heaven, the only way, in fact, nobody will be there without that perfect obedience to God's law. But Romans 3.23 tells us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4 tells us that sin is transgression of God's law. So that statement makes all the sense in the world. But the problem is, you and I can't get there from here. There is absolutely nothing we can do to rectify or correct that problem and become obedient to God's Ten Commandments. So we need help. And that help, of course, is Christ himself. Thus, the message, Christ, our righteousness, and we accept that or make ourselves righteousness by faith. Righteousness by faith. So the first thing that God had to do is get himself into the human race. And, of course, he did that in the incarnation. When God, when the Son of God became the Son of Man. And then in this first text, 1 Corinthians 15, 45, this is a very critical text that we understand this. It says that we know that the first Adam became a living soul, right? Genesis 2, 7, which says God breathed into the nostril the breath of life, or the Spirit of God, they're interchangeable, changeable. And it says then, and the breath of life, and life there is, the, Greek, the Hebrew word is chi. It's plural. It's not one, it's many. And God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man, or Adam, became a living soul. Not that he got. It's a combination of the breath of life and the body, right? But the Hebrew word for soul is nephesh. That's also plural. So God, and this is very important we understand this, especially when we come to the part in our study, and it probably won't be today, when we talk about the new theology. In the mid and late 50s, the new theology came into Seventh-day Adventism. This vicarious substitution theology, which is so very popular with evangelical Christians, we must understand this, or we're going to fall into that same pitfall. So then, Adam, then, the name Adam, which is used over 510 times in Scripture, it's almost always used in the solidarity or corporate sense. We always, we always relate the name Adam to the man. You know, Eve is the woman and Adam is the man. But in Genesis chapter 5 and verse 2, it says, Male and female created he them, and he called them Adam. Because Adam means mankind in Hebrew. In fact, in the New King James Bible, it doesn't even have the name Adam. It has mankind. Because that's what it means. So when Jesus became the second or last Adam, he became the legal representative of the whole human race. And that's important that we understand that. Because no law, God's or man's, will allow an innocent person to, to die for a guilty. I don't know if I used uh, Ted Bunty, the experience of Ted Bunty. Did, you, did I use that last time I preached here? For fear of being redundant, I'm going to say it again anyways. Ted Bunty, you all know who he is. 1980, he was a serial killer. I remember him being interviewed on 60 Minutes by Mike Wallace. He was raised in a very strict Christian home, in a strict Baptist home. But he got into pornography, and pornography can become an addiction. And it led one thing led to another, and he ended up raping and murdering 20-some women. I can't remember their number. It was a lot. One's just one too many. So he was executed in the state of Florida. But let's just suppose, for an example, Ted Bunty's mother went to the authorities in Florida and said, listen, I know Teddy did all these terrible things, but he's my son, and I love him, and I want to die for him in his place. Had the authorities in Florida allowed that, you think that would have made the evening news? You bet it would have. Why? She didn't do it. He did it. No law, God's or man's, will allow an innocent person to die for a guilty. 2 Kings 14 and verse 6 and Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 20, it says, A soul that sins, it shall die. That's a good one for our spiritual offense. For the sins of the father shall not be upon the sons or the children, and the sins of the children shouldn't be upon the father or the parents. And the wicked of the wicked shall be upon the wicked, and the righteousness of the righteous shall be upon the righteous. So guilt is not transferable. Neither is righteousness. And this creates a real problem for our evangelical friends where you just believe. Jesus, God, had to become 
the second Adam, the, uh, the legal representative of the human race. And then in our next text there, 1 Corinthians 1.30, it says, But of him, and in the New King James, that him is capitalized, and it should be, because it's talking about God the Father. But of him are you in Christ Jesus, who, who of God has made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. So understand what's going on here. In order for God to save us, he had to get into the human race. He had to become the second Adam, or the last Adam, the legal representative of the human race. As we are all sinners in the first Adam, we are all now justified in the second Adam. That's important. Okay, so then God the Father, he took the whole human race, and he stuck us all in Christ. And then he made in Christ wisdom and righteousness, and because of his righteousness, and when we get into the study of soul, soteriology of how Jesus saved us, we'll understand better what righteousness really means and what it is and what God had to do to accomplish that. And when we do that, I think you'll find then it's impossible for any sinful human being to, to merit that, to get there. So he made him wisdom and righteous and sanctification and redemption, or he justified us. In other words, everything that any sinner would ever need to be saved is in Jesus. Amen. It's already there. It's in Christ. And I want you to notice that God's doing this. It's nothing, nothing we're doing. God is doing all this. Okay, Hebrews 2.9. So we got Christ God became the second Adam. God took the whole human race and stuck us in Adam. And now it says, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels. For what purpose? For the suffering of death. Because God cannot die. And yet God's law requires transgressors or breakers of it. It requires their death. That's Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death. And that death is not uh, what we refer to as death. I think most of you know that a little over two years ago I lost my wife to breast cancer. Karen is now sleeping in Jesus waiting for the resurrection. Amen. Over 56 times the Bible refers to that, what we call death, as a sleep. But here in Romans 6.23, the wages for sin is death. And that's not a, a short period of time. That is the second death that Revelation 2.11 and Revelation 20.14 talks about. And that second death is eternal. It's forever to be separated from God. And that's the death that Jesus died. And that's the death he had to die to save us. Jesus was willing to die to be forever excluded from heaven so that sinners like you and I could take his place. Now, I'm not even going to try to explain that love. I don't think any human being can, and even if somebody could, I don't think most human beings could understand it. So I know how many people since the beginning of time have died. Just one. Jesus is the only human to suffer the second death. All the other unbelievers and wicked, as Peter tells us, are in reserve until the judgment day. But Jesus has already paid that price. Now, the... The second death that our, but we see Jesus was made a little lower uh, than the angels for the suffering and death, crowned with uh, glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every human being. Now, the Hebrew word, or the Greek word for taste there is gumama, and it means to experience. So, in other words, Jesus has already experienced a second death for every man, woman, and child, there is no reason at all that any human being be lost except for unbelief. Christ has already paid the price. And Jesus did this before any of us were even born. Amen. So I want you to understand this, that Jesus, God, he takes the initiative. Nowhere in Scripture are you going to read about the, the lost sheep going looking for the good shepherd. It's the good shepherd who comes after the lost sheep. In the parable of the lost coin, the coin doesn't even know it's lost. But, but the lady of the house searches it for diligently. That's God. That represents God. 2 Corinthians 5.14, it says that since one died, all men died in him. Now, follow this. When God took the whole human race and stuck us in Jesus, and then Jesus took his perfect righteousness, which we'll study later, to the cross, 
every human being in him died. It's not the evangelical vision that one man dying for everybody else, so they don't have to. It's, it's everybody dying in one person in Jesus. And that's critical. We understand that for our sanctification. That's why so many of our evangelical brothers and sisters don't see the need to keep the commandment. Jesus already did it. I don't have to. When we get to this vicarious substitution, and we're going to look at how it came into the church and why, and, and just the ramifications of that, it's pretty serious. So, okay, where's my clicker here? And then in 1 Timothy 4.10, Jesus became the saver of how many people? All. Oh, there is none excluded, not one. I remember reading in our Sabbath school lesson, this is probably a year or so ago, the author made the comment that the cross of Calvary does a person absolutely no good until that person accepts the cross, which is not true. Jesus, when he became the second Adam and the whole human race was put in him, he changed the history of every human being. God looks at every one of us as though we haven't sinned in Jesus. Amen. And it's important we understand that, that. And it says, so he became the savior of all men, but especially of those who, who believe. Now, of course, that salvation requires a response from us because the free will is always intact. And if we respond favorably, if we accept the gospel, then we make that salvation eternal in our lives. Okay? There, there's, there is a requirement, a response required from us. But it's, we're, a response is something God has already done for Jesus. Romans 5, 18 and 19, this is probably one of two of the most critical texts in all of Scripture. You know, be, because of one man's sin, Adam, sin entered into the world in condemnation to all men. You know, we're, we, all, we all inherited a nature that is already condemned by God. But because of one man's righteousness, we are all justified in Christ. If you get a chance, look that up in the Bible commentary. It says the Greek is so emphatic and so exact. As we are all sinners in the first Adam, we are all now justified in the second Adam. The same way. So we all have justification. We all have salvation. Whether or not you're going to be in the kingdom forever and ever is totally up to you and how you respond to the good news. Oh, I need to go back. There we go. There we go. No, nope, too far. Okay. Do, does everybody understand this so far? If you have a question, please, th this is so critical to our understanding. God takes initiative. God came down. When God became man and took the whole human race and put it in us, and then Jesus, because of his righteousness, which we'll study in, in a bit, he was able to legally qualify to save us. Satan can't cry foul. 2 Corinthians 5, 18 and 19, it says, God reconciled us unto himself through Jesus Christ, not counting our sins against us. That is, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself and not imputing our sins against us. God did this, not us. The gospel is about Jesus. It's not about me and you. It's about Jesus and what he did, and our focus must always be on Christ. And never on the Ten Commandment law. And this is where the Adventists, I think, have a problem. If I can illustrate here. I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this. I shake so bad. But I'll tell you what. I can do this. There we go. You should see me try to set a mouth trap sometimes. <laughs> Let's say that's your salvation right there. What is a condition for salvation? We just read it. Perfect obedience to God's commandments. Can we do that? No. no way. It's impossible for us to do. Never could. And yet since that is our salvation and the means of it are, the, re what the requirement is perfect obedience, this is where I think, remember last time I talked to you about Arminianism? Seventh-day Adventists are, are Arminius Christians because of uh, Jacob Arminius, remember do I, do I need to go back into that a little bit? Or do you understand that? Huh? I'm sorry. Oh, okay. 
most Protestant theology is based on two men, the Frenchman John Calvin and the Dutchman Jacobus Arminius. John Calvin put together his philosophy, or his theology, I should say. Now, and th these are God's men. I mean, Calvin was one of the greatest uh, men for God. He had to disguise himself as a peasant farmer to escape out of Paris to save his life uh, in the great controversy with Hildet. So I, I'm, I'm not trying to give you the, the implication that they're, they're bad men. They just they got a little confused. But John Calvin said that God is in control of his universe, and absolutely nothing happens in his, his universe without his knowledge and without his consent. Right? And, and Matthew chapter 12, this is not a sparrow falls to the ground without God's knowledge. And he even numbers the very hairs on our heads. Some of us make it a little easier for him than others, as I see. But, <laughs> <laughs> but at any rate, God is in absolute control of his universe. Nothing, absolutely nothing happens without his knowledge or his consent. Now, don't confuse his will with what he allows. We talked about it in another study, remember? I mean, God allowed things that he never wanted. Polygamy was one of them. From the beginning, it was one man and one woman. But he allowed it, even with his own people, even Father Abraham and King David. Uh, slavery was another one. God allowed it, but that's, that was never his will for one human being to own another human being. He allowed those things. So don't confuse with what he allows with what his will is. So John Calvin came to the conclusion, since God is in the absolute control of his universe, and nothing happens without his knowledge, then he argued and believed that man's will must be subordinate to the sovereign will of God in all things. God, in fact, one of his names, Eliana, the Most High. I am the Most Who can argue against me? Who can stand against me? So Calvin reasoned then, since God is in absolute control, then that God predestinates some people to be saved, and he predestinates some other people to be lost. And the saved he called the elect. And those that were predestined to be lost, no matter what they do, they could not alter or change God's verdict or his judgment. It was absolute and it was final. So that was Calvinism. And uh, Baptists are Calvinistic Christians. We'll read that in a little bit here. Maybe not today. <laughs> uh, but at any rate, uh, you know, they believe that the Baptists have uh, this belief, once saved, always saved. And it's, it's a combination of Calvinism and Arminianism. It's Arminianism and you're free to come to Christ, but once you come there, you're not free to leave. But we know that the free will is always intact. And even though Romans 8, chapter 8, and verse 30 and 31 says that nothing can take us away from Christ, we can leave. We still have the free will, and we'll have it right up to the second coming. So that's Calvinism. Well, Jacobus Arminius, who was pastor of the Free Dutch Church in Amsterdam, he heard about this theology. In fact, he made his way to Geneva, Switzerland. That's where Calvin had set up his, uh, his base after he was kicked out of France. But by the time Arminius got there, Kelvin was dead. Another man by the name of Beza, B-E-Z-A, had inherited his pulpit. And this man, Beza, was even more staunch and more dogmatic about this predetermined predestination uh, theology than Kelvin himself was. But Jacobus Arminius started asking some very embarrassing questions. He said, if Kelvin be right, if my will does not count for anything, if my will must be, must be subordinate to the sovereign will of God in all things, then reason, Jacobus, the evil that I do not want to do, I have no choice but to do it because God had predestinated me to do it. So Jacobus Arminius reasoned that God then must be the author of evil. And that really sent shockwaves through the Protestant world at that time. But Arminius didn't stop there. He carried his theology on to its next conclusion. He said, when, if counting that man's will doesn't count, count for anything, that God's will must be, man's will must be subordinate to God's will in all things. When God told Adam and Eve not to partake of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, he told them not to, but he knew they had to because he had predestinated them to. So at that point, the God of Kelvin in the mind of Jacobus Arminius became a hypocritical God. So, did you have something to say? Oh, 
So Arminius came up with his own theology. He said that God offers, he provides salvation to every man, woman, and child in the person of Jesus Christ. Well, Jacobus Arminius, this, uh, Professor Judd Lake from Southern University, I camp meeting a few years ago, he, uh, he explained this, and I thought he did an excellent job. Most of the pioneers, a lot of the pioneers, I shouldn't say most, but a lot of the pioneers to Adventism came out of the Methodist religion. John Wesley, the great Methodist reformer, was so impressed with Jacobus Arminius' theology that he brought that into the Methodist church, and so when a lot of the Methodists came into the Adventist church, it has brought this Arminian theology with them. The problem with that, and this is what I talked about in the first, there's our salvation, obedience to God's commandments. We can't do that. It's only through Christ, which is what the study is about. But it's only provided. You have to go after. You want it, there it is, go get it. See, the focus is on, on ourselves. We have to take the initiative. We have to go after it. You see what, see what the problem with that? It's not on Christ where it should be, it's on ourselves. We want that. I would question anybody's sanity here who said that eternal life was not important to them. It is important to all of us. That's why we're here. But the only way to get it is through Christ. But Satan knew if he could skew that a little bit, if he can keep the focus on ourselves, he has us. He knows that. We need to know that. And you remember in our first part, I offered as proof or evidence the value Genesis report that was done in the 80s and 90s in this church, the Adventist church, not this one particular, in the Adventist where they surveyed some 13,000 of our young people from grammar school right up through university level. And the results were shocking, and a lot of red flags went up. It showed a lot of good things as well. But two of the big concerns was 70% of our young people did not have insurance of their salvation. And 83% of our young people believe that their standing before God is contingent on their behavior and their performance. What is that? Legalism, salvation by works. And so our Arminian theology, then if there is a salvation we want, and we know it's obedience to God's commandment, what are we going to try to do? We're going to try to keep them ourselves, which is legalism. And then we wonder why people call us legalists. Because our history has shown we have been. You know, a camp meeting, uh, Dennis Forte, uh, the, the professor of theology from Angels, Wednesday afternoon, he came down to our campsite. So we had a nice little talk with him about this 1888 message, and among many other things. And I said to Dennis, I said, Dennis, I come out of Catholicism. I was baptized in the Adventist church in 1979. And then two of my friends, Bob and Linda Zaito said, and Bob said, well, we came out of Catholicism too. We were baptized in 1981. And Dennis, our professor said, well, I came out of Catholicism, too. I was baptized in 1977. And I said, Dennis, don't you think that we were baptized into a very legalistic church? And his answer was, yes, but I did not know that at the time. <laughs> well, neither did I until I was introduced to this message. So the problem is this, and we're going we're gonna to find this out at, once we continue in, just how alive, unfortunately, this theology is. It's faith plus our good works. It's, still, it's too alive. It's too active in the Adventist church yet. So this Arminianism then puts the focus on self. There's our salvation, but we have to go after it. Where in 2 Corinthians, it tells us in verse, God takes the initiative. God was already in Jesus Christ reconciling us to him. It's God who sent Jesus to be a propitiation, an offering to us to get us to change our hostile ways towards him, to accept him. God takes the lead. It's, the focus has to be on Jesus. Never on the Ten Commandment law. And when you have Christ, the commandments and everything else will just naturally come. But when you have the focus on the law, you're, you're a legalist. And I've been called that. And I was that. I used to be part of the problem. Now I want to be a part of the solution in the Adventist church. Travis knows me when I... In 1984, I put on a revelation seminar, which that scared him, but I was very legalistic back then. You know, it's we are saved by grace through faith. 
Period. Don't add no baggage to it. Don't say you got to do I'm gonna. I'll tell you a story. What time is it? When I close. A true story of, of something that happened to me. So this Arminianism then is the focus is on us to go after it. Jones and Wagner came along in 1888, and he said the good news is even better than that. You have salvation, full and complete. It's already given to you, even before you were born. 2,000 years ago when Jesus cried out on the cross, it is finished, it was done. He became the redeemer of the whole world. And all he's asking us to do now is do you believe that? Pardon? Say that again. Do you believe in what God has already done for us? That's the question. The question to me in Adventism is not what must we do to be saved. We must keep God's commandments. The question to me is how do we do that? And there's only one way, through Christ. Christ, our righteousness. It's the only way. And that's why God through the spirit of prophecy, tells us this is the message that I commanded to be given. And we're not. That's the trouble with the church. Uh, we'll talk about that as we get into history a little bit more. Uh, John chapter 12 and verse 32, Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I'm going to draw how many men? Every human being. That's the work of God, the Holy Spirit. That's not our work. I mean, we can... It's a work, what you guys are doing, evangelism, going out and meeting people. That's a work that Mrs. White says the angels would love to do. But God has commissioned it to us to have the privilege of going out there and being used by God. And that's a, that is a great privilege. But that's the work of the Holy Spirit to draw all people unto himself. No matter where you are, what country you were born in, it doesn't make any difference. I don't know if I have time for this story. Uh, uh, <laughs> I don't want to go too long and people start throwing stuff at me. But, but I am little enough I can hide behind that pulpit, I guess. You know, in 1979, President Carter signed the last bill he signed as president, the Conscience Clause. And it was a bill that the Seventh-day Adventist Church lobbied for. And that's kind of a gray area because that separation of church and state, that wall, needs to be there. But we stepped over that boundary and we lobbied for this bill where you don't have to belong to a labor union. I don't know how many if you folks do or not. That's not the question. But we as Seventh-day Adventists, we don't believe in that. And, uh, because the unions are not only are they strong supporters of Sunday law, but there's other activities. But at any rate, when they found out that uh, you could leave the union, me and another Seventh-day Adventist working in the shipyard, my background's electrical, and... Uh, we decided to leave. And I went to the union president. Excuse me, his name was Gene. Nice guy. I said, Gene, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, and you know, we take the position that we depend on God and not the union for our, for our labor or for our consistence, for, for, our, our pro for everything. And Gene asked me a question. And he understood. He didn't agree with it, of course, being a union man. He's not going to. I should tell you what the other Adventists, some of, I don't know, do you guys know Gerald Landonville? Do you? The mope. You know, I, I'll, I'll just take a second and tell this. I was concerned and scared about leaving the union because these guys can get pretty radical sometimes. And Darrell would come up to me, I was in the shop cutting wire, and he'd come up to me, he said, we're just going to march into that union office and we're going to tell them we're Seventh-day Adventist Christians and we don't belong to the union and we don't have to be, belong to this union anymore. And dear old walked away, and I said to myself, Lord, why can't I have that kind of faith? I was concerned. Wasn't well, an hour later, Darrell comes back. He's almost crying. I don't know if this thing's going to go well or not. These guys, they're calling me names and everything else. I said, you idiot, you got to be a twin because no one human being could be that bloody stupid. <laughs> what do you think they're, they're going to just go? Uh, they're union people. They're going to they're gonna reject that. These prefer driving our cars in the Menominee River, preferably with us locked in the trunk. So at any rate, that, that was the mope, and that's... Why you got the name of the mold? But anyway, uh, I went in and talked to Gene. And I said, Gene, you know, we're Adventist Christians, and we, don't, we depend on God. We don't depend on the union. And he, he was very kind about it. Of course, he disagreed with it. But then he asked me this question. What about the Aborigines, people that never had an opportunity to even hear the name of Christ? Are they going to be saved? And I told him the story of Helen Keller. You all heard of her, I'm assuming? 
four years old, she got a high fever, left her blind and deaf. There was a movie made by, uh, about her called The Miracle Worker. I know some of you have seen it. Uh, Patty Duke played Helen Keller. She won an Oscar for that. Was her? Okay. And then Ann Sullivan, of course, who communicates, set up a line of communication with her. I wouldn't know if I should bring that up because I know Adventists don't watch movies. Did you, did, you, are, are, did you detect my sarcasm there? <laughs> but at any rate, Jean asked me, what about all these people that don't have an opportunity to hear? And I had just read a story about Helen Keller. And I, Helen Keller, once Ann Sullivan worked out this line of communication with her, because for years she lived in her own world. And when a reporter asked her what she thought about Jesus Christ, Jesus the Christ, her reply was, who is he? And then Ann Sullivan explained to Ann, or Helen, that Jesus is the son of the living God. And her reply was, oh, so that's his name. In Romans chapter 12 and verse 3, it tells that the spirit is, a measure of the spirit is given to everyone. God's judgment can never come on any human being unless the first there is a knowledge and a rejection of that knowledge. But that is the work of the Holy Spirit. That's not ours. Okay. Got a few minutes left? Ah, <laughs> that's dangerous. <laughs> uh, when we talked about this Arminian theology where it's, just, it's there, you've got to go after it. You've got to take the initiative. And our young people continue to do that. And that's a problem, I think, a lot, why a lot of our young people leave the church. I'll tell you another true story. And I may have told this one in the past. Forgive me if I'm being redundant again. I'm, I was a maintenance supervisor for over 20 years for the C.A. Lawton Company. And on a Friday, we lost the furnace, which was going to require a lot of people to work Saturday. And some of you that go to the Green Bay Church, you probably are going to recognize this name. I heard a voice behind me say, you know, Jay, if I would have stayed a Seventh-day Adventist, I wouldn't have to work tomorrow either. And I turned around to see who said that, and here's this big burly guy, Paul Duchateau. His grandmother just died. She had taught young people, I guess, for years uh, in the Green Bay Church. She, but at any rate, uh, and I have Paul's permission to use his name in this, this story. Well, I didn't get an opportunity just then to find out, but I'm always interested in why anybody leaves the Adventist Church, but especially our young people. And I said to Paul, I said, Paul, why aren't you an Adventist anymore? And he said, and it's a very typical reply, where I'm not going to make it. I'm just not good enough. I tried. I really did, Jay. I really tried. I'm just not, I can't do it. I'm not good enough. What is that? That's legalism. He was trying to keep, where's the command? Keep these commandments here, which, but he can't. And then none of us can. The Jews couldn't do it. And I said to Paul, I said, Paul, you already made it in Christ. And you already have salvation, full and complete in Christ. And I'll never forget his response. He looked at me and he stepped back and he said, no, that's not the way I've always heard it. Now, I believe that wasn't the way he heard it because I believe Paul, when he was going to church and he went to, I think, the fifth grade in our church school, it was all the commandments. The commandments are important. They're critical. No human being will be in heaven without perfect obedience. But the only way that we as sinners can get that is through Christ and his righteousness, and we make that ours by faith. And that's so critical that we understand, and that's the trouble with our Arminian theology that focuses on us to take that for We have to do so, so we continue, and that's what the Value Genesis report showed. I mean, when you got 83% of your young people thinking that they're standing before God is contingent on their good works, that's legalism. And then we wonder why Baptists and other groups call us legalists. We are. And we've shown that. By the way, I said in our last one that Lee Venden, remember Pastor Venden? I said it was 2003. I have all the programs for the last quarter century in my camp or at, at camp meeting. And it was 2008 that Lee Venden came and had a series where he said another study like the value Genesis was done and that number went from 83% to 88. So instead of getting better, it's getting worse. And where are they getting that stuff from? Us. Our young people. And that's why a lot of our young people are leaving the church. In Romans chapter 3 and verse 31, it says, Through faith do we make void the law? God forbid we establish it. How do you establish the law? 
by Jesus. Our focus must be on Christ because Christ is the only human being that ever kept God's law perfectly. So when we establish the law, our focus and our faith is in Christ and on Christ because he's established the law. And then his Holy Spirit comes in us and brings us in harmony with his law and is established in us. But it's only through Christ. So, and I, I have up there, what is it, Revelation 3, 5. He that overcomes, and how do we overcome? By the blood of the Lamb. The same shall be clothed in white raiment. What's the white raiment? Christ's righteousness. Absolutely critical. And I will not blot his name out of the book of life. See, in, tra in traditional Adventism is we have to do something. We have to be obedient to God's commandments. We have to be good. We have to do something. And then our name is written in the Lamb's book of life. But the truth of the matter is it's already there. What's the admonition or the one you have? Pray that it's not be blotted out. Well, before it can be blotted out, it has to be there, and it is there because of Jesus, not because of anything we have done. <clears throat> so that's, that's where a lot of our, not only our young people, there's a lot of us old farts that are pretty legalistic too. Are there any questions on this? Does anybody pretty much understand? It's very critical that you understand Jesus had to become the second Adam, the second legal representative of the human race. And once we get into this vicarious substitution theology, that, that new theology that came into the church, it'll become clear why this is important. Okay, can we move on for a little bit? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, oh, I gotta do this again. What about Jones and Wagner? Uh, how long do I have? I mean, I don't want everybody mad at me. I got enough material here to keep you here at 4 p.m. I don't plan on doing that. Don't throw anything. But I, what do we got? Five minutes? Really? Boy, you're generous. Thanks, Dan. <laughs> I know what Lena, they, they throw me out. Jones and Wagner. Uh, at camp meeting, there was two seminars I really appreciated and enjoyed. One was by Peter, Peter Neri. Pete Neary, and in the morning he had one on the shakening. I really appreciated that, and he had one in the afternoon. But then there's Dennis Forte. He had one on Steps to Christ, and had, the afternoon one was on the Holy Spirit. Both, all those were excellent. But in Monday's Peter Neary's shakening, now you have to understand that it was on the shakening of God's people, which is coming, and we know that. But he made a comment that... Uh, Jones and Wagner left the church. And he grouped Jones and Wagner in with John Harvey Kellogg's, of course. And Wagner and Jones did go up there and get involved with Kellogg's and pantheism. But with Bollinger, who rejected the sanctuary, uh, Dudley Cantwright, I'm sure people must remember him. He was a Seventh-day Adventist minister for over 22 years, one of the more profound ministers that we've ever had. He left the, the Adventist church and became a Baptist. He wrote a book, Seventh-day Adventist Renounced. And uh, that's a book that our critics use today to criticize us, I guess. But at any rate, he grouped and Desmond Ford and Robert Brinsmead and Walter Ray. And we're going to, as we go continue in the seminar, or not seminar, just PowerPoint, uh, we're going to study those guys and how, what they did and why they did it, and what effect it has on the church. But I, you know, I kind of lamented that to Clint, my brother, on the way out after Peter's meeting on Monday. I said, you know, doggone it, I wish you wouldn't have said that. I said, now I'm going to have to reinvent the wheel again. Because Clint says, why? Peter did say that these two men that God chose and gave a special message to, which they did. I said, yes, but I know Adventists. And I know how they think. And all they heard was Jones and Wagner left the church. You know, that's going to stick in their mind. And it came back to me that some people from my home church was in that meeting. In fact, I heard one person say, wait till I see Jay, you know. So I knew it was coming. So, so I thought I better include something in here because some people might have some questions on that. This is from the Spirit of Prophecy again. It is quite possible that Elder Jones or Wagner may be overthrown by the temptations of the enemy, but if they should be, this would not prove that they had no message from God or all the works that they had done was all a mistake. But, you know, there's always a but.
But should this happen, how many would take this position? And that is the position that Adventists take today. But should this happen, how many would take this position and enter into what kind of delusion? A fatal delusion. Because they are not under control of the Spirit of God. Another statement from Mrs. White. Should the Lord's messengers, after standing manfully for for the truth for a time, fall under temptation and dishonor him who has given them their work? Whose work was it? It's God's work, right? Will that prove that the message is not true? No, because the Bible is true. And that's from volume 3 of the 1888 material. Because Jones and Wagner used strictly scripture to prove their point, which Mrs. White endorsed strongly, strongly, heavenly. One more statement by... uh, I believe without a doubt that God has given precious truth at the right time to Brother Jones and to Brother Wagner. Do I place them as infallible? Do I say that they will not make a statement or have an idea that cannot be questioned or that cannot be in error? Do I say so? No, I do not say so. Nor do I say any such thing of any man in the world. But I do say... God has given, uh, sent light, and do be careful how you treat it. So in other words, I guess the point I'm trying to make here, Jones and Wagner, did he get involved with pantheism with Dr. Kellogg and some other things? In fact, A.T. Jones thought a woman by the name of Anna Rice had the prophetic gift, and Mrs. White straightened him out on that. And she wrote to the General Conference president, I believe A.E. Olson, and she says, I have more confidence in Brother Jones now than I had before this incident with Anna Rice. So... They were humans, like you and I, they were sinners. But here's a question. Please do not throw the baby out with the bathwater. You know, and we have a tendency to do that. One more statement. Uh, last words. The last words of Wagner wrote before his death on May 28, 1916. That was just a year after Ellen White died. Uh, to M.C. Wilcox, who I believe was the General Conference president, I do not question but freely acknowledge the superior goodness of the brethren in the denomination. I should be recant to God if I did not recognize the light that he has given me. I can never understand why it was given to me except on the grounds that his gifts are bestowed not according to desire but according to need. Jones and Wagner knew they had a message from God and they knew they had... By the way, how many people got the prophetic call before Ellen White? Three? I know two. Two. And they reject, and one of them, one white guy and one of them was a black guy. One of them went around saying, I'm a lost man. Can you imagine that? I'm not sure which one it was. But these guys knew, too, that they had a message from God, so they had to give it. Uh, some of the last letters from A.T. Jones before his death on May 12, 1921, reveal a humble spirit and a complete confidence in the Seventh-day Adventist message and in the ministry of Ellen White. The point I'm trying to make is neither one of these men left Jesus Christ. And yet, because they left the church, Seventh-day Adventists believe they're lost. Exactly. Uh, Dennis Foute, you know, the theologian, uh, I talking about this, and I, I said, Dennis, so many Adventists think because Jones and Wagner left the church, it would be more driven out of the church. And when you find out really what was going on, you would understand that. Uh, but I said, a lot of Adventists think that they're lost, you know, that... Uh, and I said, that, they didn't leave Jesus Christ. That's not true. And Dennis agreed with me. It was true. They, they are not. Pardon? Can I ask a question? Sure. Elijah, who was one of the leaders at that time? Was it Elijah? Or Isaiah? Uriah? Uriah Smith? Oriah Smith? Okay, did he not grasp the 1888 message? No, he did not. He did, not he, he did later. No, in the 1888 material, uh, she wrote a letter to him from Australia in Volume 3, and I don't have it here, and she told him right out, if you continue down the road that you are going, you will be lost. Uriah Smith, in front of the, in the Battle Creek Tabernacle, uh, which seated 6,000, I believe, it was a huge, he stood up and did admit that he was on the wrong side uh, in, in, in 1888. G.I. Butler, who was a general conference president, Uriah Smith, 
J.H. Uh, Morrison, who was the president of the Iowa Conference. In fact, of the 90 delegates at the 1888 General Conference in Minneapolis, less than 20 accepted Jones and Wagner message, which Mrs. White continued to endorse as light, as truth. In fact, I got over 25 statements, and I think I gave, gave one of these to Travis, where God's calling them, or Mrs. White calls them God's messengers, <coughs> a, a message from God. You know, she keeps reiterating that over and over and over. But Uriah Smith did repent. So, in fact, if you remember last time uh, I spoke, in a letter that Mrs. White wrote to A.E. Olson, who was gen the, then the General Conference president, if you remember this, uh, well, she quoted Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26 and 27. If we continue to sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for your sins. She's telling a general conference president at that. And then she closes her letter, and this is from Testimony to Ministers and Gospel Workers, page 97. Go on a little longer as you have gone and rejecting the light from heaven, and you are lost. How would you like to have the prophet tell you that? You see what I mean? That's it. You know, and Peter brought this out, I thought, excellently in his seminar. A couple more minutes, I'm going to finish this. He said, because Mrs. White, he said that he used the word was under the influence, because she sided with Jones and Wagner, they called her a liar, their brother. Now, stop and think about this. 90 delegates, over 70, were opposed to that message. Stephen Haskell was one who accepted it. He chaired that 1888 General Conference session. But there was less than 20. So that means most of the leadership of that Seventh-day Adventist church was under the influence and control of Satan. And she says that. Now that's something to think about. I have it right here. I... Sad. It's, it's scary. It's terrible. An unwillingness to up preconceived opinions and to accept the truth laid at the foundation and a large share of the opposition manifested in Minneapolis against the Lord's message through a uh, me message through brothers Jones and Wagner. By exciting that opposition, Satan, so now we know, Satan succeeded in shutting away from our people in a great measure the special power of the Holy Spirit. God wanted to pour out his Holy Spirit in the form of the latter rain. That's Joel chapter 2 and verse 23. And Satan prevented it. Now you think about that. That is pretty scary. Then you wonder why she wrote this letter. And this wasn't the first time. She told J.H. Morrison and Nicola, uh, Henry Nicola, who, are, who was a leader in the Iowa conference, she said, I, it, I don't want this Minneapolis spirit here. If you two don't change your way, you're going to be lost. So she wasn't afraid to speak her mind. But that, and Peter brought this up at, in Wednesday's meeting, that camp meeting. They called Mrs. White a liar. They did. They started questioning whether or not she had the prophetic gift. They did. They sent her to Australia. They broke up the trio. Sent her to Australia, sent Wagner to England, and he kept Jones here in the States. And they did. And Mrs. White told him, the Lord is not in this. But in a vision, the Lord came to her and told her, you go to Australia. I've got a work for you to do there. And, of course, Avondale College. And she did a lot of work there. So, it, I mean, the, the whole general leadership ridiculed her and cut her down. And they absolutely despised Jones and Wagner. And as, when we get into this a little bit more. But it's... That being said, please understand, the message is Christ our righteous. That's the message they brought. That's the message we got to study because it's the only thing that's going to save you. Okay, uh, we're going to stop here, I think. I don't know what's up next. Oh, well, maybe nothing. Oh, here we go. Okay, this, this is a good place to stop. This is where I was supposed to start this morning. This is part two. We only went over part one. Yes, yes. Jones and Wagner exalted Christ's divinity. That was a radical statement at that time, especially if you were in uh, Dennis Fulton's uh, seminars. Uh, they saw him as self-existing, having life in himself, possessing by nature all the attributes of divinity. Wagner unequivocally proclaimed at the 1888 General Conference, we believe in the divinity of Christ. He is God. And that was a new thought. And as we go is, we're going to find out, uh, well, I'll give you a peek. Many, many Adventist pioneers had Aryan roots, and they saw Jesus as being created. We'll, we'll get into that a little deeper next time, okay? Uriah Smith in 1865 wrote a book 
in that Christ was the first created of all beings. And the text he uses, Revelation 3.14, the beginning of creation of God. He thought Jesus was created. When that text in the Greek really means at the beginning, Christ was there. He was creator. Of course, we know that John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 and 16. Jesus was creator. So we'll study that next time. So we have a closing song.